my Nakabatachi, this is Joy Girl with a chapter review of chapter 1011 titled Code of Sweet Beans. Okay, and before we get to the chapter review, um, yes, we've got another face cam. And like I mentioned in my last video, today is the last day of my mid-semester exams. So it's my final exam, at least for at least another month. Um, you know, I get one month of peace or peace and one piece before my final exams actually begin. But this is the last one. My this is the last one of my mid semester exams, and despite that, I think I should mention that I might actually still continue with these face cams for at least the chapter reviews. Um, apart from all of your super nice comments, it's just a much quicker and easier way to do these videos. And as you guys know, I stick to the official releases of chapters, so I'm already delayed. And then the fact that I also actually have classes on Monday, which is the day that the official chapters are released in Australia. So having these quicker methods of getting these videos and getting the chapter review out, I think will just be the better way to do things. Um, so yeah, we'll Hope you guys haven't gotten sick on my face yet because you might be seeing more face cams at least for the chapter reviews. Anyways, let's get to the chapter itself. So I want to start with Big Mom because I really enjoyed her character in this chapter. Her character and sort of her unpredictability. And we've seen this trait, we've seen how unpredictable she is in previous arcs. You know, we've seen it in Whole Cake Island with all the twists and turns in her personalities. But we see it again in this chapter and I thought that was great. So in, the, in her interaction with Tama, in her conversation, it was just such a contradicting, um, such contradictory remarks that she made. You know, for example, she is complimenting Suru and she is expressing her gratitude to, towards Suru who fed her the, um, the Shuriko, but as she does this, she calls her a busybody. Or when she's commenting on the Okobore town and thinking of how nice everyone was to her, she thinks of it as a grimy town. Or when she talks about the deliciousness of the Oshiriko itself, she's, you know, she has to comment on how what a tiny serving it was. And these sort of contradictory comments really portrays her character. So we see Big Mom's speech pattern is just very much like that of a child, of a kid's. And I think it's just so honest. You know, you could call it brutally honest, but I think that's actually really what makes makes this interaction between Big Mom and Tama such an enjoyable moment. You know, it was just so, so enjoyable because we, because I can really feel how genuine that interaction was. And I can't help but smile at that. You know, in an arc where the idea of destiny is actually quite a prevalent theme in this arc, you know, we've got, we've got multiple children who have their father's names to live up to or live up against. You know, we've got the idea of the scabbards trying to fulfill the will and the dream of Odin's. And then we've even got Kaido's crew, you know, a lot of them, a lot of whom didn't actually join out of volition, but sort of out of fear. Or even not to mention, you know, the recipients of the smile or the defective smile devil fruits who can't actually, who can't control their emotions and can't express what they're truly feeling. And now we've got the added part of being under Katama's control after eating her devil fruit power. So in an arc where we've got all of this, you know, quite this idea of destiny and being sort of under the will of others, it's just very refreshing to see Big Mom, who is just acting, you know, completely out of her own will and doing whatever she wants, saying whatever she wants. And it's just so genuine, which I really enjoy, you know, because she's just there acting out of her own desires, really wreaking havoc on anyone. She actually looked like King Kong or Godzilla, you know, walking around just so huge. She even made Komachio look tiny in comparison. And she is just switching sides and joining the alliance or switching sides as she, as she wants to, just out of what she wants to do in that moment. And I really mean that she is wreaking havoc on anyone because it could be you one moment and then your enemies the next. But because of this, Big Mom's character is just so much fun and I'm really enjoying what a wild card she is. I also found her mention, the Code of Honor, very interesting and again, a very contradictory um, thing for Big Mom herself to say. So the reason why it's quite interesting is because I don't think that in One Piece, we've actually seen the idea of a Code of Honor or a Pirate's Code being explicitly mentioned, being explicitly expressed to be a code before. So, you know, we've got, we've seen sort of hints of this, that each pirate crew may have their own code, but we've never been, ex we've never seen it being expressed as a code explicitly until now. And so for Big Mom to be the character to introduce introduce this um, idea by name is also very contradictory because her code seems to be against 
a sweet innocent town being um being endangered whereas we know from her past previous actions that she is known to destroy towns as she fits as she sees fit no matter whether they're innocent or not and then also another contradictory moment where prometheus mentions that big mom is known to have a mother mode um which again is just quite funny when we when we remember that we she has been shown to be quite brutal against her own children and speaking of brutal, I think we should also mention sort of the bits of action that Big Mum um, has been shown with in this chapter. So we've got two of these big showcases of action and of Big Mum's abilities. And the first one that we need to mention is Big Mum's use of advanced conquerors Haki um, in that attack when she just punched page one. Now, before this, we actually never saw Big Mom use Advanced Conquest Haki before, but I guess now that we've seen the main character in Luffy using Advanced Conquest Haki, and now that we know and it's been confirmed that it exists as an ability, that means we're going to be seeing a lot more of it and anyone could have it now. But in all seriousness, I kind of feel bad for Page One having to be the recipient of Big Mom's attack. Actually, I feel bad for Page One in general in this arc, because apart from the fact that He's just been sort of treated as a kid and he isn't being taken seriously even by his own Toby Roppo members. He seems to be used as sort of a measuring stick and as a guide so that we can gauge the strength um, and the abilities of whoever his opponent is. You know, so for example, we saw it when Sanji used the raid suit, um, used the raid suit up against page one. We saw page one being used to sort of showcase Luffy's development since his training, and now we're seeing it with Big Mom and the fact that she can also use Advanced Conqueror's Haki. And speaking of Big Mom's attack, man oh man, I am super excited to see the interaction between Ulti and Big Mom. So we know that Ulti witnessed Big Mom attacking Page One, and we know from previous um, portrayal that Ulti is very, very protective of Page One, and that she really cares a lot about her brother, and that she gets quite enraged when he is in danger. And so Ulti witnessed Big Mom attacking Page One, which is probably the biggest attack that Page One has faced in this arc so far. And so we know from Ulti's character as well that she isn't one to back down from a fight, no matter who her opponent is. So are we going to? See, so it seems like we may see Ulti face off against Big Mom. And knowing how angry Big Mom is in this chapter, we've got an angry Ulti and an angry Big Mom. And guys. I am excited. But moving on to another Big Mom attack, it's confirmed that Big Mom has a new homie called Hera. So I predicted in my last chapter review that her new homie would be called Nyx, you know, based off Greek mythology. And it seems like we do have a Greek mythological character or figure, but this one is actually called Hera, which makes sense because it is Zeus's, um, Hera is known to be Zeus's wife and sister. And this could be really interesting because in Greek mythology, Hera has actually been known to betray Zeus before, and she's also known to be a very jealous and a very vengeful goddess. And most of this is because Zeus has engaged in multiple, um, numerous affairs with other women, and Hera is known to have shown punishment and gotten her gotten her vengeance by punishing the women that Zeus has spent time with. So it'll be interesting to see whether that plays into the arc. You know, for example, would Zeus's time with Nami be considered an affair? But back to Big Mom's new homie, there's a panel that showcases just um that shows just the lower half of Hera's face. And because of this we couldn't actually confirm um the true form of Hera. So we can't actually confirm whether she's just a much larger cloud than Zeus or whether she's just pure light which is how she was portrayed when Big Mom was holding her. But either of these two, I think it makes sense because that seems to um, showcase why she is a bigger threat and why she's more dangerous than Zeus is. And speaking of Zeus, actually, we see Zeus very, very close to Nami. They're in very close proximity to each other. But forget Zeus because now, more so than wondering whether Zeus is going to return to Nami, I'm more interested to see whether Nami is going to contain and control um, Hera. In terms of strength and power, it seems like Hera is just Zeus on steroids because we see the devastating impact that it has, that she has when Big Mom attacked Kid and Killer. You know, it blew a massive hole into onto the um, Onigashima Dome and... Although Kid and Killer seem to have been able to avoid much of the impact, we do see that Kid was somehow impacted and damaged because his grip and his hold on Zeus and the metallic um, metallic box containing Zeus has weakened. And I don't know whether that's because 
so much because kids' concentration and focus has been impacted, or maybe it's actually just because the distance, the larger distance between him and Zeus now, because um the range of his ability. But moving on to Kid and Killer, it seems that this chapter was more about setting them up for their future matchups. So for Killer, we've got Hawkins or Hawkins and the and the number of beast pirates whom were there, you know, witnessing all of this unfold and were um and were accompanying Hawkins. Although I think these poor souls are actually going to be just used and sacrificed as part of Hawkins' attack and his ability, which we saw earlier in this arc. Um, but anyways, between these two, there was a quite a nice interaction. I really like the trash talk. I thought that made their interaction a lot more enjoyable. And it's uh, we get another we get another prediction by Hawkins, ninety two percent for Killer. Which, if we compare it to other predictions that Hawkins has given in the past, 92% is actually quite a high chance of survival. But if we take think about it seriously, 92%, 92% is actually a very low chance of survival. And so that's quite interesting because now we have to see what makes Hawkins so confident and what gives Killer such a low chance. And as for Kid, Kid is going after Big Mom. And I thought that this decision and I thought this choice of Kids was actually a very, very smart decision because you know it's true that if Big Mom isn't stopped from joining um, Kaido back on the rooftop they're just going to phase combined attack after combined attack and I also thought it was a very mature decision that Kid made and quite a nice showing of his character development because earlier in the arc, earlier in the arc it seemed like Kid was very focused and engrossed with the idea of you know defeating Kaido himself you know, sort of out of his own personal vendetta against Kaido because of what the Yonko did to Killer and his crew. Whereas now it actually seems like Kid is focusing on the mission at hand and um, has made this very, very mature and smart decision, which I quite like for Kid's character development. And of course, Big Mom is a force to be reckoned with, you know, herself. And whether that's going to be a one-on-one -on -one fight against Kid and Big Mom, whether Ulti is going to be joined and whether Ulti is going to be, you know, thrown into the mix, you know, whether it's going to be a completely other matchup where Kid's going to have to fight someone else. Now that it seems like Big Mom has joined the alliance against Ulti uh, or against Page One and Ulti, and so there are so many possibilities. But what I do really want to mention also is the interaction between Kid and Killer. And this is a relationship that I really want to see more of and I'd be really interested into finding out the backstory of because we see here and we have seen in other moments as well that despite their positions and despite Kid being the captain of the crew, they seem to be sort of on equal footing. You know, we even see Killer sort of being the one to give out orders on some occasions. And apart from the fact that um, that's because, you know, Killer is four years older than Kid, I just think that there could be more to this story. And I actually do have sort of my own theory as to that backstory and sort of my own headcanon that I conjured up based off a drawing that Oda did of all the supernovas when they were younger. And so my story is, and how it goes, is that Kid, based on his drawing, seemed like he was a very, very poor kid. You know, he grew up... Huh, kid was a poor kid. The poor kid was a poor child. You know, he grew up quite poor. You know, his clothes were ragged, had holes in them. You know, he was just... It seemed lonely playing with a robot. You know, he seemed like a character out of the Grey Terminal. Whereas for Killer... Killer actually looked like he grew up proper, you know, grew up quite nice and proper, eating ta eating at a table, you know, with nice and proper clothes. And so the story that I've conjured up is that maybe one day Killer, you know, walked into and happened to find himself in Kid's Town and found himself being harassed by some of the other inhabitants in Kid's Town, you know, in the rougher village. And Kid actually helped Killer out and saved him from this situation. And that's sort of where their friendship and their relationship begun. But anyways, that's just my sort of crazy scenario that I've conjured up. And, you know, you guys know and you guys probably have, have already realized that I like to come up with these sort of crazy um, scenes in my head, you know, even just based off drawings that Oda's given in an SBS. But back to this chapter, we also see a nice, brief, fun, short clash between Luffy and Kaido. And I don't think that we're going to be seeing this one for a while now. Just the way that it ended, you know, with um, the big Haki clash, the big Advanced Conquerors Haki clash. And that actually really, and this entire fight, sort of um, this brief interaction, this brief clash between the two, really was quite reminiscent 
of the clash between Roger and Whitebeard in Odin's flashback. You know, what with um both the wide smiles of Luffy and Kaido before their before their Haki clash. And it sort of got me thinking that maybe if this battle intensifies, um, then we actually might see them split the skies. Because it seems like they haven't really gotten serious yet. You know, they have they're not fighting for real yet. And they're sort of still, you know, having fun, testing each other out. Or maybe it's Kaido just testing Luffy out before he demolishes him again. And the reason why I say that is because Luffy actually is still fighting Kaido in his base form whilst Kaido is in his hybrid form. And so it seems like Kaido isn't going serious yet and won't actually start fighting seriously until maybe Luffy transforms into one of his gears. And I would really like to see Luffy use um, Gear Fourth, and maybe see whether he can use Advanced Conqueror's Haki whilst in one, uh, whilst in Gear Fourth. And the one I'd like to see in particular is Snake Man, just because of the incredible speed Luffy has when he's using that form. I'd also like to see um, whether Gatling Gun, whether Luffy can use Gatling Gun with Advanced Conqueror's Haki, but whether he can use this level of Haki, you know, um, in such quick succession isn't yet to be confirmed. Okay, and let's talk about Tama now. So we see in this chapter that Tama is actually able to control a Yonko with food. Not food in terms of her Kibidango that she produces with her Devil Fruit powers, but food that she's shared, you know, out of generosity and in, um, in sort of kindness. And I think that was really quite meaningful. You know, we see here that Tama is making allies, you know, both with her devil fruit abilities, but also just because out of her kindness and her friendship. And that, if we remember, that's exactly how she became friends with Luffy, by sharing rice with him. And that's a big part of why Luffy decided to help Tama, because of her niceness and um, of her friendship in sharing food with him when she didn't have food herself to eat. And I think this is actually a really nice showing of the influence that Ace had on Tama. If we remember from the flashback that Ace pretended that he couldn't get out of the restraints and was, you know, willing to share his food with the um with the with the poor villagers because he knew that they didn't have food of their own to eat. And so it seems like um seems like Ace and that legacy has just played a big part of how Tama has grown up. But if we go to Tama's Devil Fruit ability itself, because we do get a very pe big piece of information in this chapter that her Devil Fruit isn't able to be used against normal Zoan Fruit users, um, just against the Smile Zoan Fruit users. And that really seems to strengthen an idea or a theory that I had that Tama's Devil Fruit is actually an man a man-made artificial Devil Fruit in a similar way to how Momo's Devil Fruit power is also artificial. But I think I want to discuss that in more detail in another video. Maybe we can have another Let's Talk Wano episode. So make sure you tune in to that discussion when that's created. And now I have to mention some of my other favorite moments in this chapter. And that was the interaction between Nami, Usopp and Tama. Man, I love this trio. Just seeing that cute um, Kunoichi, the aspiring Kunoichi, being brave and mature in the face of all of this, um, all of this you know, battle going on. And then the exact contrast when we have Nami and Usopp just being scared out of their lives, you know, um, just their tears. We even got an Usopp expression face in this chapter, like a, <laughs> which I thought again was just hilarious. And this group just gave us so much comedy in this chapter, which I loved. You know, even Nami calling Usopp an old man, you know, despite the fact that she's older than Usopp herself. But in seriousness, I also quite appreciated that the focus on these three actually gave us a nice touch of like, relatability in this chapter. So in sort of the previous chapters, we've been seeing a lot of, you know, very fierce combatants or former warriors in the case of Hyogoro um, being shown to be fearless in the case, like in the, um, in the face of tough opponents. And whilst that makes sense for their personalities, it sort of makes us lose perspective of sort of the danger that we are currently facing in Wano, whereas when we see it from the perspective of Nami and Usopp, we really see the perilous situation that they're placed in, and it sort of makes us helps us not to lose sight of you know the true dangers that we're facing here. And then to see Nami and Usopp still fighting, you know, coming up with their own attacks and you know showcasing their own unique um, forms of courage and bravery, I thought just made it even more meaningful that they were still so determined and still willing to fight despite the fact that they were so scared. And now for the color spread. So we've got another color spread in this chapter and that's of the Straw Hats eating ice cream, which I love because I love ice cream. 
And some of the most interesting things that I picked up in this chapter or in this color spread was that again, typically Sanji is not eating his own ice cream. So I imagine that he is the one that uh, made all the ice creams for his crewmates. He's not eating the ice cream and he's just sort of shown carrying wafers to build other sundaes. And it's one of the most interesting things that I actually noticed whilst reading One Piece is that Sanji is rarely ever shown eating his own food. You know, as the chef, he's always shown cooking for others, but he's never really seen eating. And my head canon for Sanji's placement of being placed higher than Zoro in the color spread, you know, being above Zoro on that um, ladder, is supposed to represent how Sanji has a higher bounty than Zoro currently in the arc. But then Zoro smiling up to Sanji is sort of like as if he's teasing Sanji that regardless of their positions, regardless of the fact that he's lower than Sanji, that he's the one that's had the more awesome and epic moments currently in the arc. Um, but seriously, I love these two. They're two of my favorite characters and this is just such a cute, um, cute color spread and such a cute moment between these two. And you know, it seems like Zoro is smiling up at Sanji or smiling up in his direction. So, you know, see guys, they don't hate each other, they can get along, and so if they can get along, you know, we should get along too. Although in saying that, it seems like Sanji may be annoyed at Zoro, maybe for the way that he's eating his wafers, maybe he's saying that Zoro isn't eating the wafers correctly, um, you know, and maybe that's actually because Zoro finds that the ice cream is too sweet. I think I've read before that Oda revealed in an SBS that Zoro doesn't like sweet food, um, so maybe wafers, good, ice cream, too sweet. And speaking of the way that Zoro is eating his food, it's actually a very nice level of detail that Oda has again included into this color spread, where all of the straw hats are eating the ice creams in very unique ways that's quite fitting of their personalities. So for example, we've got Luffy, who's just all covered He's completely covered with ice cream and I have to admit that I like that one because for me personally, when I eat ice cream, when I eat any food to be honest, but more particularly ice cream, I do cover my face in ice cream and I do f realize afterwards that I got food, you know, um, <laughs> that I got food stuck on some other places that I don't know how. I don't know how that would happen, so I can relate to Oda's depiction of Luffy. And the final detail that I wanted to mention about this color spread is, oh my goodness, wouldn't it be a dream to have Robin's Devil Fruit abilities? If you notice that she's actually using three hands because she's eating her ice cream, so using one hand for that, and then reading a book with both hands, with, with two other hands. So what a handy, you know, um, Devil Fruit to have. And with that, I think that brings us to the end of the review. So as always, please leave a comment below on what you thought of the chapter, you know, any questions that you may have or your favorite moments. And please um, feel free to stick around to watch my reactions. That's also been included at the end of this video. And please do subscribe if you haven't already. Um, please like and share the video. And this is Joy Girl. I'll see you again soon. All right, guys, let's do it. Chapter 10,011. And... We get another color spread. Okay, look at this. It's just the straw hats all having some ice cream. Oh, I love it. Look at that big Nami over there with practically a sundae on a cone. That is massive. And Luffy as well. This is great. Zoro just looks so happy. Look at his big wide smile, his big grin. I mean, I'd be happy if I was eating all that ice cream as well. I don't know if you guys know this. I've mentioned it before, but ice cream. So hot chips or potato fries and ice cream are two of my favorite foods. What a fun and random um, color spread to have. That's great. Okay. The title of this one, though, is The Code of Sweet Beans. Okay. So it seems like that's a reference to Ashuriko. Are we going to see a return of Olin in this chapter? Uh, or maybe it's Tama and Big Mum. Okay, alright, let's get to it. Oh, so it is going to be about Big Mum. Oh, maybe we're going to find out her powers. Maybe we're going to find out that third homie. Oh, no. It is, oh, no, it's a new homie. Hera. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So it's not Nyx, like I said in the last review, um, it's Hera, which is actually another Greek goddess in Greek mythology. Zeus's mum, I believe. No, Zeus's wife, actually. It was Zeus's wife. Makes sense. So it's Zeus and, um, Zeus and Hera. Zeus is actually freed, though. It was kids' uh, metallic 
um, I guess, force. So if Zeus was freed and the um, the constraints, the metallic box around him is sort of let loose, that must mean that kid is in danger. Oh. <laughs> Law's leaving him alone and taking everything else. Look at Luffy, so sick in that little, um, in the dome created by Law. Sure, just sitting, standing by himself, doesn't mind that they've all left. Oh, I love it. And then Kaido just fallen in the background. You can see his claws. Love it. Oh, <laughs> I love it. And what he says to Luffy, you know, you're enjoying it. The, the more dangerous, the more precarious the situation is getting, the wider your smile is. <sighs> and look at it. They're both, and it's funny that he says that because they both have that wide grin, that wide open smile. Man, this is great. Oh, look, Luffy's charging at him again. Kaido's back up. Yeah, look at that. Oh, and then another kick. Boom. Not even touching each other. Wow. Look at that impact. Look at that blast just right on top of Onigashima. Wow. Okay, so Kid and Killer are back on the third floor. And they really did get blasted. Seems like they're going to have to face some of the other beast pirates instead. Who is it? Straw Sword. <gasps> it's Hawkins. Oh, this is great. It's going to be Hawkins versus Kid and Killer. You know, they were once part of an alliance before they got captured and Hawkins switched over to the other side. Well, yeah, and see, that's what Kid says, you know. You've come to finish yourself just like a traitor would. I was wondering when we would see Hawkins again. You know, we hadn't seen Hawkins for a while. Um, and, you know, here he is. Oh, and Killer is sending Kid off to go by himself. And that's great, isn't it? Because I was going to say that, you know, two against one and it's Hawkins. Not to say that Hawkins isn't strong, but I felt like being a bit of an easy matchup and it wouldn't be a fair portrayal on how Kid, um, on Kid's strength. So this is great. I like this. And I suppose after Hawkins, um, Hawkins also sort of betrayed him and betrayed the group, betrayed the alliance, switching over to Kaido's side. It was really a killer that, you know, brunted all of um, Kaido and Orochi's sort of wrath. You know, he was the one that was forced to eat a smile devil fruit, a defective smile devil fruit at that. You play a good lap dog. Oh, look at that. A little bit of trash talking. I love a good trash talk before a fight. I don't need a single ounce of your luck. Go to hell. Oh, I love it. And yes, okay, we see Tama back. <laughs> the dino man jumped on the tail. No! Oh my goodness, page one is following them. And look at how close he is to Usopp. And Nami as well. And when will you finally give up? I love what that says about each of the characters. You know, that the straw hats have been determined, you know, haven't been trying to, um, haven't given up and still trying to defeat page one and try to still fight against the beast pirates whereas you know page one you know as a dinosaur has a lot of durability which is you know something that we already knew <laughs> i love it oh i love this panel that's great look at nami and Usopp. they've got tears coming from their eyes they're terrified and yet they're still being brave and they're just fighting they're trying to um they're trying to fight him off but you can tell that they're so terrified i love it <laughs> aim for the weak spots aim for the weak spots <laughs> temple jaw adam's apple oh that sounds painful Oh, look at Tama's determination. You know, I don't care what happens to me. We're just going to get to the stage. She's willing to risk her life on this, um, on the line. What a true samurai, you know, a true Kunoichi. <laughs> Call him Usopp an old guy. Oh, I'm so scared. I can't go on much longer. Oh, that's a nice touch. That's a very nice moment. You know, it brings a lot of, um, I like that we get that here. You know, after a few chapters of seeing all the all the bravery not even just on the rooftop which has been you know epic with all the really really hardcore um you know very strong combatants you know risking their lives and even before that looking at some of the alliance members and how determined they have been the scabbards you know hyogoro seeing all of them 
and they were all quite fearless, but they bring a really nice touch of humanity, you know, of some sort of relatability. They're in this battle and they're not meant for battle, you know, they're not suited to this sort of conflict. Um, and so to see their fear, to see them admit that, I think that's, this is a really nice touch. Okay, Usopp's stepping up. Usopp is stepping up to the plate. I'll take care of this for you, Tama. Don't worry. Oh. Yes. Oh, exploding pine cones. <laughs> How do you like them cones? It's sort of like a reference to the ice cream cones from um, the color spread. <laughs> but, oh, Usopp's got a shocked razor. Oh. Okay. Okay. So we get that confirmation. Those dumplings don't work on Smiley, um, on normal, uh, on normal Zoan devil fruits. It has to be the artificial smile devil fruits. Okay, so we've got a bit of a limitation, so that wipes out the, that cancels out the, um, the Tobiropo, the commanders, most likely, and, um, and Kaido himself, which, you know, I don't think, we were really suspecting that Kaido himself would be impacted by Tama's devil fruit. But still, nice sort of confirmation that we got there. And oh my god! Oh my goodness! It's like... What? Okay, so there is Big Mom. Jeez! Give these guys a break! Now they're gonna have to face Big Mom! What? Oh, look at their faces! Like, uh, Nami and Usopp, you know, they're back to crying. Ah! This is terrifying. Look at her size. Look at her size. She is massive. It's like, she's as big as, like, the buildings within the castle. It's sort of like seeing a, um, seeing a scene out of, like, a King Kong or Godzilla movie. You know, just like a huge beast tearing through towns. Oh, wow. Oh. Hmm, it's you, that cat burglar, and the one with the long nose. I love that. They just keep referring to him as long nose. You know, um, page one just said it to Usopp before, so I'm going to tear that long nose off. Oh, look at Tama. Oh, hi, Olin. So sweet, so cute. Oh, and look at that. So Okay, this is so cute. Look at Big Mom, just a sweet reversal, like a 180 switch on her, um, on her personality. Look at them, just having such a cute conversation. Oh, and that's what Prometheus says, like, as she goes into mother mode every now and then with little children. This is so sweet. That's actually something that I mentioned in a, um, in a video before, that we'll see a return to Tama and Big Mom's relationship. And because of their closeness, Big Mom might actually start helping the Alliance. And I always thought that it might be because Big Mom turns, um, reverts back into Olin, you know, suffers from sort of, um, like, another concussion that makes her lose her memory again, that gives her another amnesia um, episode. But even without it, they've been close, they've been friends. This is so sweet. And look at the, look at the horror, um, how horrified Nami and Usopp are, you know? You're friends with her? Oh, look at that! So sweet, Big Mom just has a nice big smile on her face. Oh, oh, look, oh, Tama's upset. Oh, that Okaboda town isn't there anymore. Burned it to the ground. Oh, Big Mom's fury. And, oh, Tom is crying. Oh, look at Big Mom. We are seeing it. Big Mom is going to go against Kaido's crew. This is awesome. Yes. Look at that anger. You can see it. Oh. Page One is going to brunt it. It's, it seems like as well. Page One's come back and is chasing the crew. But I think it's going to be in for Big Mom's wrath. Big Mom, perfect timing. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Don't you know that even in the cruel world of pirates, there's still a code of honor? Boo! What? Yes! Big Mom's just punched page one! Jeez! Oh my goodness! What? Oh! <laughs> Okay, so Zeus is back. Oh, so Zeus is back as well. And there's, we just saw Nami with the crew. And then we're going to see Zeus return to Big Mom. What's going to happen there? Oh, and kids found out. Okay, sounds like Big Mom's over there. And oh, Ulti has witnessed the scene 
Ulti's just seen Big Mom knock her brother out. And oh my goodness. Wow, I was not expecting the raid to go on like this. This is not what I was expecting for the next steps on Onigashima. But I am all for it. This is amazing. What? Yes. So are we going to see Ulti face off against Big Mom? Is it going to be a joint attack? Is Kid going to join in? What is going on? This is so... This is just such an unexpected turn of events. Okay. My goodness. How cute was this? How cute was this chapter, you know? We had such a cute and sweet little color spread. And then we get, you know, Big Mom and uh, Big Mom and Tama just being, you know, the closest of friends. So, so sweet. Okay. Alright, that was fun. Okay. Alright. Bye.